Cris, então vamos conversar hoje com os nossos inscritos, vamos conversar com as pessoas, porque muita gente tem dúvida sobre o visto EB2, principalmente na modalidade NIW, onde eles mandam muitas questões, muitas perguntas, muitas dúvidas, porque cada um acaba escutando uma informação de um lado, de outro, muitas vezes em, em outros, outras fontes que não são fontes técnicas, não são advogados, e eles trazem aí é, essas informações, às vezes por ouvirem falar em outros lugares ou por falta de informação mesmo. Então vamos conversar hoje sobre a questão do EB2, principalmente na modalidade NIW, e nós vamos trazer aqui algumas perguntas que muitos dos nossos inscritos falaram, quiseram questionar e mandaram para a gente. Muito bacana, Cris, então vamos fazer essas perguntas. Eu vou fazer as perguntas em português para as pessoas entenderem, nós vamos deixar na sua, logo embaixo da sua imagem a tradução para o português quando for para vídeo em português e vamos inverter quando for para outras línguas. Vamos lá, primeira pergunta que mais faz. Quais são as diferenças entre o processamento consular e o ajuste de status? Há diferença no tempo de processamento? E existe diferença entre os custos e na entrevista? Chris. Excellent question, Daniel. I think this is something that um, everyone should know uh, in terms of the difference between consular processing. And there are actually two processes you can do with consular processing, one directly to USCIS and one at the consulate in Rio de Janeiro. Um, I think some people think when they hear consular processing that there's only one method, and that's actually not true. And with adjustment of status, that's something you want to do if you're in the US. And if you're here as a non-immigrant visa status, then this is something you can apply for. And if you get approved, then you will have to adjust status. Um, as to the processing time, it is similar, except that if you're doing consular processing, you have to keep in mind that um, you're at the mercy of the consulate. So if the consulate is closed for any reasons, the work that may, that may be done at that consulate may not be taking place. As whereas at USCIS, the work will be continuous. Um, normally the processing times uh, when you're doing consular processing is around um, 10 to about 18 months. I have gotten some people approved under 10 months, but um, they had they were very strong candidates. And so I think it, we I think it took about nine months. But um, just bear in mind that when you're doing consular processing, it will go through USCIS, then it will go to the State Department so that you'll go through the National Visa Center so that your interview will actually take place in the consulate. Um, with USCIS, and you're doing adjustment of status, then your adjustment of status interview will be at your local uh, USCIS service center. Um, with respect to cost, if you're doing consular processing, you're actually only paying for the I-140 fee. And so it is much less than if you were doing the adjustment of status in which normally we do a concurrent filing for your employment authorization, your advanced parole to travel, as well as your adjustment of status. So those fees are substantially more than just your I-140 fees. Cris, uma pergunta que eu recebo muito, muito, muito nos vídeos e as pessoas às vezes confundem um pouco, porque elas pegam informações aí às vezes de pessoas que não, não, não são advogados ou que eles não têm aí é, experiência para falar sobre esse assunto. E é uma pergunta que pode parecer simples, mas fica na cabeça de muitas pessoas. É, eles querem saber se de repente eles podem fazer o ajuste de status enquanto eles ainda estão no país deles. Ou seja, ele espera o EAD, o cartão EAD, o Combo Card, conhecido como Combo Card, no país dele, e aí ele já sai do país dele com a autorização provisória de trabalho, a autorização de viagem, que é o parole, e podendo chegar nos Estados Unidos já com uma autorização de trabalho sem ter que esperar aqueles 90 dias para poder fazer algum outro tipo de processo dentro dos Estados Unidos. Explica um pouquinho melhor isso para a gente, Cris. Oh, that's a great question, Daniel. Um, I, I think what everyone should know is that if you are applying for adjustment of status, you need to be in the United States. Um, because you cannot apply for adjustment of status if you have not been in the United States. And we won't be even able to be submit your EB2 NIW unless you've been here for at least 90 days. So what is very important is that this is not something you can apply for and wait and then come to the US. You have to be in the US. 
So if you're intending to apply when you're outside of the US, you must do consular processing. Cris, outra pergunta que muitas pessoas fazem para a gente, eu vou dividir essa pergunta em duas aqui, porque eu acho que, que, que é importante a gente, a gente delinear isso. Primeiro, como a gente faz a definição, como que as pessoas podem fazer a definição do tipo de negócio que elas vão abrir nos Estados Unidos? Qual vai ser a proposta de negócio dela? Como elas definem essa proposta de negócio nos Estados Unidos? Wow, this is so important in anyone's petition, Daniel. The proposed endeavor is what will get you approved. Um, this is the major component of what your strategy will be to get approved. And Absolutely, you need to work closely with your attorney. Um, your attorney is going to help you figure out what is your proposed endeavor. It's a component of your education, your experience, your expertise, and your exceptional ability. And these are all things that you may think, oh, I know what this is, but it's going to take an experienced US licensed attorney to say to you, um, this is what I see as being your proposed endeavor, because this is what is necessary in the USA, especially because the national importance will weigh into what your proposed endeavor is. And if you're going for a national interest waiver, which is what you're doing with an EB2 NIW, it is crucial that you have this component be a major component of whatever your proposed endeavor is. And you will not be able to figure that out on your own. You need the expertise of an experienced attorney who can guide you to craft the exact proposed endeavor you need to present the strongest petition that you can do so based on your profession, education, and your exceptional ability. Okay, Chris. E uma das perguntas que eles fazem, por isso que eu dividi em duas essa questão, é... Eu preciso de um professional plan ou de um business plan? Eu, é, isso é necessário dentro do meu processo? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I know that some people think that it may not be necessary because it is an additional expense that's quite high when you think about the fees and everything. But it's necessary because this is going to show what your proposed endeavor will do in the U.S. So if you can't put it, if you can't formalize something about your proposed endeavor and how it will be executed when you're in, in the U.S., it's not really going to further your argument for your national importance to get you the national interest waiver. So this is an opportunity, whether you are a professional, talking about how you're, how you're going to contribute to the U.S., or you are someone who is going to be opening up your own business to contribute to the U.S. But opening up your own business doesn't mean you're opening up a brick and mortar uh, company. It could be about providing services as well, consulting services, uh, mental services, medical services, but all of that will be in your plan so that USCIS or the consulate can see that This is how you're going to contribute and make a difference in the U.S. and allow you to show that whatever your proposed endeavor is, that it could succeed in the U.S. and therefore give you a greater probability of getting a national interest waiver. Chris, essa é uma outra pergunta muito importante aqui. Com base na sua experiência como advogada nos Estados Unidos, com mais de 30 anos de experiência de advocacia nos Estados Unidos, você poderia dar alguns exemplos desses proposed endeavors é, que têm mérito substancial, ou seja, o que poderia realmente ser substancial para caracterizar-se dentro da, da, da necessidade dos Estados Unidos, né, que pudesse se caracterizar dentro desse National Interest Waiver? O que, que você tem de experiência que poderia contar para a gente aqui como alguns exemplos para as pessoas entenderem melhor? Oh, yes. This is the magic formula. Um... You want to be with an attorney who's going to be able to look at, again, your profession, your education, your expertise, and what makes you so special to come up with a proposed endeavor that will have substantial merit. Um, and I don't want to say that there's a formula that's going to work for one petitioner and always work for every petitioner. It's really up to the your attorney who will be able to advocate what will work best to come up with the strategy for what will be um, a proposed endeavor that will have substantial merit. And I love to give an example. Um, this is an example I love to give because people are very surprised by this. I was able to get someone in the vaping industry approved. And when you think about that, you think, 
how can somebody who's in the vaping industry have substantial merit? And that's to show you that whatever your skill set is, whatever your profession is, if you are eligible, your attorney who's experienced should be able to craft a proposed endeavor that has the substantial merit to warrant your approval and an NIW at the same time. Chris, e obviamente continuando nessa mesma questão do substantial merit, fala pra gente, por favor, baseada na sua experiência, que tipo de evidência nós podemos juntar num processo para demonstrar essa questão, para comprovar esse substantial merit do aplicante, do cliente, da pessoa que está solicitando o EB2 NIW. Oh, this is so important, Daniel, um, because you could have the best resume and you could have exceptional ability, but if you can't document the what your skills are with the evidence that you can provide, then your chances or probability of success are very, very slim. So I like to include a lot of conclusive evidence, such as letters of recommendation, supporting letters, awards that you have received, recognition, and also if you're doing something very unique in your space. Um, I had a client who, who was a business development specialist, but one of the things that was kind of unique about him was that he had actually produced a lot of training videos for his country's military de uh, department. And, and he just kind of shared that with me in passing to say, oh, this is kind of something interesting that was done. And I thought that was fascinating because we are in a world where everything is done through virtual learning, through videos. And what a great way to be able to solicit security video training um, through for local governments, for the federal government, for the defense. And this is something that he had had tremendous success with. And I just ran with it. And it was fabulous to be able to show that. And this is something that he didn't even think was anything unique, but I felt that it was. And it showed the merit of what he could do with the skill set that he had. And that was a very big component of his petition. And, and it was very, very, um, Rewarded for, rewarding for him because USCIS saw it that way as well. Chris, e com base na sua experiência, você consegue dar algumas, alguns exemplos né, de, do, do Proposed Endeavor que, que possa estar encaixado nesse, nesse quesito de importância nacional, de interesse nacional? Consegue dar alguns exemplos para as pessoas conseguirem enxergar também? Porque são duas coisas distintas. I think people often think that it's sort of cookie cutter. You know, if, if this is your occupation, this is what the national importance will be. But I think the skill set of your attorney will determine how are you going to make the argument for national importance. And you have to think about it in broad terms of how you're going to impact the United States. And it could be on a national level, a state level, a local level. And you could think about it in different levels of industries as well in terms of, am I going to contribute to create jobs? Am I going to create um, more revenue, what impact am I going to have on the community? And you have to think about national importance of broad implications for the country. And so if you can take what your proposed endeavor is and see how it can apply in terms of benefit to the U.S. to stimulate the economy, to produce jobs, to provide some kind of necessary skill set for that community, then you can have a strong argument. So I don't want to say there's a, just only a cookie cutter way to make that argument. I think a better way to look at it is you take your skill set and what makes you unique in your profession and try to see the national importance that it can have and make an argument in that way, as opposed to just thinking of, oh, well, I'm not going to be able to stimulate the economy. I'm not going to be able to uh, create jobs and think that, well, I'm not going to have any national importance. And I never look at a situation like that. I always think broadly and also focus on your skills to see what impact you have. And it's not just your singular impact, but it could be an impact you have uh, through the resources that you may provide in that Uh, profession that you are in. Cris, nós sabemos o quanto é importante a atuação de um advogado num processo desse. É muito importante o advogado conhecer, primeiro, o que ele está fazendo, ter experiência no que ele está fazendo, e a experiência vem, obviamente, ao longo dos anos, dos erros, dos acertos, das, do, do sucesso e do, do, do não sucesso, às vezes, que a gente tem. Então, eu, eu, eu gostaria de perguntar para você qual é a importância, qual é o suporte que um escritório de advocacia 
pode fornecer? Qual é a relação que um cliente com um advogado pode ter para que esse tipo de documentação seja apresentada da forma adequada, o processo seja montado da forma adequada e, principalmente, para que o projeto seja apresentado da forma adequada para a USCIS ou para o consulado, dependendo de onde ele estiver fazendo a aplicação. This is very important and this is it goes to who you pick your as your attorney who would advocate for your EB2 NIW. Um, you have to keep in mind that your petition will only be as good as your attorney is. Um, the petition that you may submit for a software engineer will be very different from when you submit for a business administrator or somebody in finance. So therefore, you have to understand how will you work with the law firm or the attorney that you select. And one of the important things about that is the documentation that will be produced. One of the things that I pride myself on is once you retain us, we have a very organized system in which you get a document checklist. So you know what documents you have to prepare. But then you will work with my legal assistant or another legal assistant who will work with you to say, oh, you need to get a letter of recommendation. Well, what is that? Or you need to find supporting documentation of the projects that you've completed and you've received awards on. So it's not that you get this checklist and you're told, go get these documents. You will always know what document you need, how, how it fits in with your petition so that you can see and understand the merit of why you're trying to get these documents. Because if you don't know what it is you're getting and you don't know why you're getting, then how can you understand the significance of what your supporting documentation is? And you have to work closely with your attorney and the other people who work with your attorney to understand that so that you are getting the right documents to show what your national importance is to the US and to USCIS. Muito bem falado, Cris, eu concordo totalmente com você. A, a, a posição de um advogado e a atuação de um advogado dentro de um processo desse vai muito além do que às vezes as pessoas imaginam. E a experiência realmente faz um, uma diferença muito grande. Vamos para mais uma questão aqui. Em relação às cartas de recomendação, quantas cartas são necessárias no meu processo? Quem deve escrever essas cartas de recomendação? E, por fim o que as minhas cartas de recomendação devem conter para comprovar aquilo que nós temos intenção dentro do nosso processo. Another great question, Daniel. Um, this is something that causes much angst to the clients because if you've been working for over 20 years or over 15 years, you, you think to yourself, oh my gosh, I need to go back to my first employer and, and get that recommendation letter. And yes, you do because we want to document all of your worthy accomplishments. And so we work very closely with our clients to um, determine where and from whom you should get your recommendation letters, because we want, to, we want these letters to validate certain aspects of your career. Um, for instance, we don't want to get you know, three letters from when you were first an engineer or you started your first job. We want to make sure that there's a progression of your expertise and skill set. So we will look at what you've done and we will focus on the major, accomplish major accomplishments you have had. And in line with that, we will say, well, we should, we should get someone who can validate that project in which you played a key role for uh, a major municipal center or may maybe another big uh, infrastructure program, or maybe you've been doing all this software work for a multinational company. So we look at what you've done and what highlights we want to get from that. Because remember, we're trying to highlight your best work. And so to the extent that we can do that, your letters of recommendation are so important because it will actually highlight and focus the major accomplishments of everything you've done in your, your professional career. So we will look at, when we come up with your strategy, we will look to see what important um, projects, what important um, achievements that you've had. And we will go towards those um, achievements and recognitions that you reserve, you received, and then ask to get a recommendation or supporting documentation from those employers. And it's very important because remember, we're trying to highlight um, all of your achievements and major achievements, especially those achievements that can have an impact in what you do in the U.S. Because if 
we can highlight that, then those are things that you could do in the US and that could also go to validate your national importance, which will help you get your national interest waiver. So when you hear these things, um, a lot of clients get very anxious having to think about, oh my gosh, am I gonna have to contact you know, 10 employers that I've worked for? And no, you won't. But we will focus on key employee, employers, especially if you've worked for multinational companies so that you can get letters of support, letters of recommendation from those individuals. And usually what I like to do is I like to weave in um, their actual words into your petition because I think it's very important when USCIS hears the words of previous employers to say, this person is gonna do great things. Not only have they done it for their company, company, but what they did has had major global impact. And when USA hears words like that, that shows that your proposed endeavor could have an impact in the US.